One of the most fascinating ideas in evolutionary medicine is that there is conflict between parents and offspring, and actually between parents as well, over how much should be invested in the offspring. And we'll now start discussing that, and I'd like you to see where these ideas came from. Bill Hamilton came up with the idea of kin selection. That was then picked up by Bob Trivers, who saw that it implied that there would be conflict between parents and offspring. Then David Haig saw that in pregnancy, there would be a conflict not only between the genes in the mother and in the infant, but within the infant, the genes that came from the mother would be in conflict with the genes that came from the father over how much the mother should be investing in the offspring. The basic idea of kin selection uh, is one that was had by Bill Hamilton, and it says basically that what matters in evolution is not individual survival, but the increase in frequency of genes. And it would therefore pay an individual to sacrifice itself if more copies of that genes got into the next generation than would happen if the individual did not sacrifice itself. So this takes the whole way we think about evolution away from the individuals that we're used to looking at and it reformulates it in terms of what are the interests of the genes. The costs and benefits of an act are then weighed in genetic currency. So how many more copies did it get me or how many copies did I lose? The interesting thing is that genes exist not only in our bodies, they exist in the bodies of our relatives. And if an individual can help its relatives to survive and reproduce, and if that increase in the number of its genes that it gets in the next generation through offspring of relatives because of that act is greater than the decrease that it gets in its own offspring because it had to give up something in order to do that, then that helping behavior will be selected. This is a really key idea. It helps to be uh, aware that evolutionary biology has an explanation for what we call altruism and cooperation. It's not really altruistic in the uh, normal sense of the term. This is actually selfish from the point of view of the genes, but it leads the organism to behave in a way that we call altruistic. The guy that had this insight was Bill Hamilton. Bill died 13 years ago. Uh, he grew up in uh, the Downs, south of London, and as a boy, he was close enough to Darwin's house that he could walk over and walk around the house. It was within striking distance for a boy to walk. This is a picture of Bill on the Amazon. He was a passionate naturalist as well as a great theoretical biologist. In 1964, <clears throat> as a graduate student, Bill formulated the idea of genetic costs and genetic benefits of ACTS. And the basic idea is that a benefit is the increase in the fitness of the recipient of the act. The cost is the decrease in the donor's fitness. R is their coefficient of relationship. So that is the probability that a gene in the donor and a gene in the recipient are identical by descent from a common ancestor. R is 0 0.5 for mother offspring, okay, in, in humans. And the relationship of one sibling to another, brother to sister, is 0.5, and to a, ha to a half sibling is 0.25. So those are some of the kinds of values that R can take on. Given that, the condition for helping is that B over C is greater than 1 over R, or that B times R is greater than C times 1, or to put it into English, the increase in the relative's fitness as a result of the act, that's B, times the relationship to the relative, has to be greater than the decrease in the donor's fitness as a result of the act, times the donor's relationship to itself, which is 1. So when you, when you take that equation apart and write it out like that, it all seems to make sense. So what are some of the kinds of traits that have been proposed as, instant, as cases of this kind of, quote, altruism or cooperation? Alarm calls, so birds and ground squirrels and primates, 
will give a call when they see a threatening predator that attracts the attention of predators to themselves, but it allows relatives to escape. Guarding behavior and vigilance, same kind of thing. You have to make yourself pretty conspicuous in order to be on guard. Helping at the nest in birds, uh, that is a case where the helpers are usually the older offspring that are helping parents raise younger siblings. The suppression of reproduction in uh, bees, ants, and wasps, and in social carnivores like meerkats and wild dogs, and in naked African mole rats, there is usually one female that is doing all the reproducing, and she is being helped by all the other males and females in the social group. And in some of these, there are alternatives. So these are cases where this has been offered as a hypothesis, and in some of them, there are reasonably plausible alternative explanations. The basic idea of parent-offspring conflict is that a parent in a diploid sexually reproducing species is 50% related, 0.5, to each of its offspring. However, an offspring is 100% related to itself, it's 50% related to its full sibs, its brothers and sisters, and it's 25% related to half sibs. So those would be uh, offspring of the same mother, but a different father. Therefore, an offspring should try to extract more investment from its parents than its parents have been selected to give. The mother has been selected to give equal investment to all of her offspring. She's related to all of them than 50%. However, the offspring, being 100% related to itself, but only 50% related to sibs and 25% related to half sibs, would like to extract more investment for itself up to the point where it's damaging the mother's investment in its siblings just exactly enough so that it's getting the same amount of fitness through its siblings as it would be getting through itself, okay? So it's not like it doesn't want them to get anything. It wants them to get something, but it wants more for itself. Bob Trivers is the guy who had this idea, and he had it as a graduate student at Harvard in about 1970. So about 10 years after Bill Hamilton had the idea of kin selection. Bob saw that there would be conflict between parents and offspring, and he saw that they would disagree over how long the period of parental investment should last, over how much the parents should give to the offspring, and over how the offspring should behave towards each other. The, the prediction of relatedness is that there will be conflict between siblings, and the interest of the parent is that there would not be conflict between siblings. Okay. Parent-offspring conflict is expected to increase during parental care, and offspring are expected to employ both biological and, for complex organisms, psychological weapons in conflict with their parents. There are parent-offspring conflicts in pregnancy, as well as during the period of lactation and uh, before weaning. The fetus is expected to extract more from the mother than the mother is selected to give for the arguments just given. Fetal tissue in the placenta can manipulate maternal physiology via hormone production. We've seen how that can happen when we discussed the evolution of the placenta. These manipulations are made easier if the fetal tissue invades maternal tissue in the placenta, and we've seen that that has happened in our lineage. There are then two main paths to increasing fetal provisioning, that is increased maternal blood pressure, that can lead to preeclampsia if it's done too much, and increased sugar concentration, that can lead to pregnancy-related diabetes. The man who had this idea is David Haig. David is a professor at Harvard, and he more or less picked up the torch from Trivers, who had gotten it from Hamilton, and he applied these ideas in the early 1990s. In addition, David noticed a connection to genetic imprinting. Genes are imprinted by being methylated or by being acetylated. And imprinting basically turns the gene off. 
There are some genes that are imprinted differently in the germline of fathers and in the germline of mothers. That is called parent of origin or genomic imprinting. Those genes are then not expressed early in fetal development, so it's turning off something. Then later in development, before they get back into the germline for the next generation, they are reprogrammed. The, re the adult could be either a male or a female, so it has to have the pattern of imprinting that is appropriate to its sex. There is a relationship here to kin selection. The mother is 50% related to each of her offspring, but if she has future offspring with other males, then only this offspring is 50% related to the father. He is, the father is not necessarily related to that female's future offspring. Okay? If she has her offspring by other males, subsequently, he won't be related to them at all. So to the degree that mating is sequentially polygamous, Paternal genes will be selected to extract more from the mother than the mother is selected to give, and maternal genes will be selected to resist. So that's the connection between imprinting and kin selection. Father is turning off genes that downregulate growth. Paternally expressed transcripts enhance growth. Mother turns off genes that upregulate growth. The copy of the gene that comes from the mother is expressing transcripts that inhibit growth. The normal state is an equilibrium, and in that state, the mother and the offspring are in pretty good condition. If, however, there is a disturbance, then the conflict is revealed, and that would happen when the action taken by one parent is canceled by disrupting the imprinting. You can do this in mice with genetic manipulation. That produces a plus or minus 10% difference in birth weight. In humans, we rely on mutations that produce rare diseases. More on that later. So basically, if the father's interests are canceled and the mother's interests are expressed, the babies are 10% lighter. And if the mother's interests are canceled and the father's interests are expressed without being countered, the babies are 10% heavier. This idea is now quite well supported for the genes IGF-2, insulin-like growth factor 2, and IGF-2R, that's the receptor for insulin-like growth factor 2, and for two other genes, but it's not yet as well supported for some other genes that also have sex of origin imprinting. So the genetic and developmental evidence is starting to be assembled, and it looks like there might be something to this. So, in summary, natural selection acts to increase the frequency of genes, not the survival of individuals. Genes can influence their fate by influencing actions that affect the success of their relatives. The parent and the offspring, a relative, are, however, in conflict over reproductive investment. The offspring is selected to demand more than the parent is selected to give. They disagree over that. Maternally and paternally derived genes are in similar conflict within the offspring. Okay, so this is a conflict between the one that you got from mom and the one you got from dad inside you. That appears to explain parent of origin imprinting. In both cases, the normal condition is an equilibrium in which things work out fairly well, and that is an equilibrium in a tug of war. If that equilibrium is disrupted, it manifests as pathology. That pathology is not selected by evolution. That pathology is due to a perturbation of what is selected by evolution.